Oh, there we go. Oh. Okay, everyone. Thank you for coming. Sorry, this is because a classroom. I'm currently training to be a primary school teacher, so I'm in a kind of when I'm in, when I'm in a classroom now. I have this particular need to do a roll call uh, to make sure everyone's here. Because we have to do roll calls after lunch. Someone may have gone missing during the break, or you may have seen out a runner to try and locate that student in the ground in case of full and over run out in, into the road. Uh, so my name is Matthew Dentis. I have a PhD in conspiracy theories. It's not strictly true. I have a PhD in philosophy. I'm an applied epistemo epistemologist. So my interest is in what is it reasonable to believe given the available evidence. Uh, I thought it would be very interesting to look at belief in conspiracy theories and generate a notion of when it might be rational to believe the conspiracy theory given the evidence, given that the standard view on conspiracy theories is that they are suspicious beliefs that we've got a prima facie or typical view that we can take a dim view of. So I spent four and a half years working on a PhD dealing with reading about conspiracy theories day in, day out, and there's no better way to become a conspiracy theorist <laughs> than to be constantly reading about conspiracy theories, but also constantly reading the newspaper like a conspiracy theorist. So you end up going, now if I was a conspiracy theorist, I'd probably link this thing to that thing. And it's only a very small jump to go, if I were a conspiracy theorist, these two events would be connectable. To actually go, hmm, I think these two events are connected. And actually there are some very famous examples of conspiracy theory skeptics who have turned into conspiracy theorists later in life. So it's actually quite possible that extreme paranoia on my part may erupt at any moment. So if this lecture takes a really lecture session takes a really weird turn, it's probably because the psychological pr process is starting now. Uh, so, so I wrote a PhD on conspiracy theories. I've got a book coming out later this year with Palgrave Macmillan on this particular topic. Uh, and that's due on the 30th of April, so I'm currently in stress mode about finishing the book. Everything I think about at the moment is related to the book. Uh, and I've also been passionately involved in teaching critical thinking skills uh, for about 10 years now, mostly at the tertiary level. So I've been teaching critical thinking skills to undergraduates and also adult education students. I'm currently in the process of retraining as a primary school teacher at the moment. Because all the literature in critical thinking says, teach it before the end of first language acquisition phase, which is before they're about, they're about the age of eight, at which point you can instill critical thinking in them is an innate skill. Everything after that becomes progressively more difficult. And as someone who's taught critical thinking skills at the tertiary level, so the 17 and 18 year olds, it is very hard to change how people think and to instill critical thinking in the populace. And disturbingly enough, uh, there are a large number of academics within the university system who probably should have learned critical thinking skills at a much er earlier age, but I won't go into my particular issues with the academic route at this particular point. All right, who here is interested in the teaching angle of critical thinking? Raise your hands. Okay, who's here for the conspiracy theories? You can vote twice. I kind of thought that would be the way things would go, uh, so I, I will tailor the talk to basically suit the mood of the session. Uh, there's no point in my going on about pe pedagogical principles if only four of you are going to actually appreciate that, but actually all this is going to relate back to what I do when teaching critical thinking. Okay, the first bit of housekeeping we need to do is I want to make it quite clear that we're not here to defend any particular conspiracy theories. So if you've got a burning conspiracy theory you want to prove to someone in this classroom today, uh, I'd like you to present it not as your own particular belief, but simply an idea that's out there in the world. This is useful because it allows us to play the role of devil's advocate. You can put forward a conspiracy theory in the safety of this classroom, and we will not assume that you believe it, you simply want to talk about it and analyze it. So this way, it allows you to put forward your deepest, darkest conspiracy theories that you know everyone laughs about, but you can put them forward as, well, people might laugh at this, but what about this particular kind of hypothesis? The second bit of housekeeping is quite simple. If you've come into this room with the belief that conspiracy theories are typically unwarranted, yes. which is, say, they're unjustified, or the kind of belief, that we should take a dim view of, take that idea, roll it into a ball, and throw it out that door. 
For the purpose of this session, we are going to assume that belief in conspiracy theories in some cases can be justified. And we're going to try and look at why that might be, and also look at reasons as to why that might not be in some cases. And the best way to do that is to take an open mind towards conspiracy theories at this point, and we can talk at the end as to whether that open mind, open minded approach is the right way to do things. All right, now the next bit's going to be a few slides, and then I'm going to open this up to actual discussion. Uh, so no one really likes to be called a conspiracy theorist. This is Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky is actually a very famous conspiracy theorist who doesn't like to be known as a conspiracy theorist. He describes conspiracy theories with respect to institutional problems in large organizations, corporations, and government. But when you actually get down to what he's talking about, he's basically renaming conspiracy theories with a different kind of not, not, not nomenclature. And that's because he doesn't want to be called a conspiracy theorist. Typically, conspiracy theorists are the kind of people that we take a dim view of. Now, that being said, some notable figures have actually admitted to being conspiracy theorists. Christopher Hitchens uh, was quite happy to admit to being a conspiracy theorist about the October Surprise Thesis, the notion that it was actually Ronald Reagan's campaign team that delayed the release of the hostages in Iran and scuppered Jimmy Carter's electoral chances and made Reagan president. So Hitchens was of the firm belief that this hypothesis, which is widely derided in most American political history, uh, is actually the true explanation as to why Reagan became president. Most of us will engage in claims like this. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but, where when you say I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but, what you're describing after the but is clearly going to be a conspiracy theory. You just want to avoid being tarred with this particular label. Uh, sorry, that's just an amusing joke, but in fact I made a uh, spelling mistake about Patsy once and turned into pasta. Uh, famous conspiracy theorists include David Icke, uh, who's a footballer who believes in alien shape-shifting reptiles trying to take o over the world uh, from interdimensional space, believes that the moon is a space station which is broadcasting a mind control signal all the way from Jupiter, uh, and he gives nine-hour talks. I've actually been to one of his nine-hour talks. He is the only person I know who gained energy throughout a talk whilst drinking gin and tonics. Uh, this is Jenny McCarthy. Uh, when it comes to conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorists, she's enemy number one when it comes to the MMR vaccine and the autism link. She's of the firm belief that the MMR vaccine is responsible for the increased uh, prevalence of autism in our society and arguably is one of the major reasons why people are not vaccinating their children in America. Uh, this is Pamela Geller. She's of the firm belief that Barack Obama is not an American. Uh, this is John Dewey, a very famous American philosopher who was also a conspiracy theorist about this thing called the Moscow Show Trials. And this is Beloved David Bellamy, who used to be a big figure when it came to conservation and the environment on TV, and he claims there's a massive conspiracy against him because he's also a climate change denier, and that's the reason why he's no longer on TV with any particular pre prevalence. New Zealand does punch above its weight when it comes to local conspiracy <laughs> theorists. We have Ian Wishart, who has an entire magazine devoted to conspiracy theories. Has anyone read Investigate recently? Are you aware that Investigate now comes as a flip magazine called Investigate Him and Investigate Her? <laughs> so Ian Wishart has reintroduced the 1950s. On the him side, you've got articles about financial conspiracy theories, boating, garages and driving. On the her side, you have conspiracy theories about sex, education, and where to buy your bridal dress. It's really quite bizarre. Uh, but obviously, there is a market for this. Uh, this is John Ansel. Uh, so he's a former advertising campaign person for National Labour and Act. He's of the firm belief that there's a large-scale conspiracy in Aotearoa to ensure that all hard-working Kiwi taxpayer dollars are being funneled towards Māori. And he 
is meant to be in the process of setting up a political party to contest the election. Although he keeps talking about it, nothing seems to have actually eventuated. Uh, this is Jonathan Eisen. He's the publisher of Uncensored magazine. If you've never read Uncensored magazine, it's essentially the internet in a magazine with the hyperlink still nicely on the page in blue. So you can open it up, you can see a hyperlink, and then your immediate reaction is to tap it, and then nothing happens because it's dumb paper. Uh, this is Brian Leland. Uh, he's a member of the New Zealand Climate Science Coalition, which sounds like a nice think tank, but is a climate change denying group uh, who's caused a l large amount of bother towards NIWA in recent years. Uh, he actually turned up to a talk I gave, which the slide was included in. Uh, I actually thought he'd stick around to actually ask questions afterwards, but he then left, uh, he left quite quickly. Uh, yes. Yes, yeah, I think I th I, it seems to be a, dist a distinguishing feature. Uh, and this is our most successful conspiracy theory export overseas. This is Vinny Eastwood. Has anyone heard of Vinny Eastwood? So Vinny Eastwood has a two-hour internet radio show which is syndicated in the US. It gets an awful lot of listeners. The advertising pays for Vinny's lifestyle. Uh, he's been involved in the Stand Down Len Brown pro protest marches and such like. He's actually a very successful New Zealand-based conspiracy theorist operating in the overseas markets. Uh, and there's part of me that's actually slightly envious of Vinny here because he's actually making a reasonable about amount of money out of conspiracy th theories in a way which I kind of wish I would be able to do too. But Vinny's an advocate. Just a point, Wishart and Eisen both actually sell quite a lot of magazines as well. Oh and yeah, the oh yeah. Which is the most bizarre piece of work, uh, are actually, they're, they're stronger than, than they ever do in magazines. Yeah, I mean, Investigate has a very large subscription number. It's actually quite astounding. And since it now comes out, quarterly, but it seems to pay its way quite admirably, despite the really shocking production value. It's a really awful magazine to look at, not just the content, the actual production value. Uh, it's pixelated beyond all belief. It's hard to know exactly what's going on there. Okay, uh, actually I'm going to, to skip through here because I don't want to talk for too long because otherwise everyone gets bored even though I'm sure I'm very charming with the, uh, the way I'm talking about things. Okay, what I want you to do is a bit of the old think pair share. This comes through from my doing primary school teaching. Turn to the people around you, and I want you to talk about the conspiracy theories you know of, and then I'm going to give you about three or four minutes to actually have this discussion. Select someone in your group that you formed to report back. We're going to throw those conspiracy theories up on the board. I want to see just how many conspiracy theories we can generate. So turning to the people next to you, try and form groups of four, five, or six, and generate these conspiracy theories. Yeah, I know I'm <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, half a minute. Okay. So we've even at the front can maybe head for that. Turn to the back towards me, please. Alright. Uh, can I have some conspiracy theories with this group? Uh, um, we've got Paul, Paul McCartney still at uh, his beard. Oh, the Paul McCartney, McCartney conspiracy theory. Brilliant. We're replaced by a lookalike in the 60s. Yep. Wow. <laughs> Who here has not heard about the Paul McCartney conspiracy theory? Oh. Uh, this is a great example. So which album cover is it again? Simon Pedro. No, no, no. no, no. It's Abbey, Road. Road. Abbey, oh, Abbey Road. Abbey Road. So Abbey Road, you've got the four Beatles walking across the road. For some reason, Paul McCartney is not wearing shoes. This has been taken as evidence that he died <laughs> and has been replaced by a Paul McCartney lookalike. Yeah, that's <laughs> the great thing about playing any song backwards is it's actually possible to hear almost anything. But, all right, uh, anything else from you, Brad? Oh, we had heaps more. Prince of Sky, 9-11. Alright, so, oh, so we've got Princess Die, 9 11, it's good enough time for beer. Alright, let's go over here. What are you doing? Oh, moon landing, obviously. Oh, yep, the moon landing. That's great. Anything else? Um, various ones about the recent plane crash. Oh, MH370. Yeah, your plane was great. Yeah, so that was There was 20 passengers who worked for a company who was recycled. Yes, the uh, pa the passenger manifest for MH370 um, has been analysed very extensively, and there's basically for every particular person who belonged to a particular corporation, there's a related conspiracy theory <laughs> about it to explain why some world government or some organisation might have decided to do do away with them. Oh yes, Kim Trails. That's always good. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really a conspiracy, but it's kind of on the same thing. All the views are like Atlantis, and people who think that the lines are from Atlantis and the Egyptians are from Atlantis. Oh, yeah, yeah, all right. So, uh, so there's the alternative history crowd, uh, of which New Zealand has its own particular group, alternative history. Anything else from the back of the room? Um, Kennedy, Sergeant Oh, yep, JFK. Aliens. Aliens. Oh, well, the Richtian Shakers is fitting the any uh, to <laughs> yeah. different types of alien conspiracy theories. Anything from that side of the road? The Philadelphia experiment? Oh, yes. Yep. So, which is basically the old secret weapon mm. testing hypothesis. Oh, right. the, the name Ken Ring came up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. He's in Ring. Pearl Harbor weekend as well. Pearl Harbor? And I was wondering about homeopathy. Suppressed inventions. Suppressed inventions. Ah, a Jonathan Eisenberg. Do you know who published it? No. A U T. Oh, he somehow he somehow talked them into letting them have it in for a new zone. That's really. 
<laughs> really quite scary. Uh, I've got another New Zealand one. Yep. Um, there are early settler reports of a beaver or otter-like creature in the South Island. Oh, yes. Now, what's that called? The Ota Otaki or something? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so uh, New Zealand's uh, our secret That's mammals, NZ. Alien big cats down in Christchurch. Ian Wishart's lesbian Marxist conspiracy. Oh, yes, yes. I put it down just as Helen Clark. And actually, there is a disturbing category of homophobic New Zealand conspiracy theories. The Christchurch earthquake was blamed yes. on the lesbians. Oh, actually, the no. Christchurch <laughs> earthquake is <laughs> actually uh, another civil union um, legalisation. Yes, yeah, basically, basically. But that's not a conspiracy theory, those are just art. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, so, sorry. So, herein lies the next question What is it that links all of these particular theories together? So what makes these conspiracy minority theories? Opinions? Nothing. Hmm? Minority minority opinions. Opinions. All right. So we. Mu I'm going to. I'm going to raise more of this work from the board. I've taken photos. If anyone ever wants to re resurrect it. I think all the ones you have up there aren't supported by evidence. All right. So we've got a psychological claim yes. or a sociological well, claim. Do you want to have the warranted ones? Yep. Um, uh, I'm thinking that the U.S. government. By the public on the for invading Iraq. Yep, so we've got. Yep, the and Iraq invasion. Um, yeah. <laughs> and Diebold, um, which I figure, if not. Yeah, it's not shown that both have been manipulated, it has been shown that they could have been in fact not. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. someone else had a. Uh, Wednesday Wednesday yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Sorry. So the Sheffield Wednesday football ground disaster. 100 people got crushed to death, and it's, after 15 years, it's finally proved that 300 police statements got changed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 That's right. It's a football disaster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Lockerbie. Lockerbie. I'm gonna put up the Moscow show trials. What's the conspiracy theory there? Oh. The Moscow show, show trials. So this was like Stalin, right? Yeah. So in the 1930s, Joseph Stalin was convinced that Leon Trotsky was conspiring with sympathizers in Russia to take control of the Russian state and reignite his own particular form of the communist re revolution. Stalin asked the Proso KGB to investigate this. The Proso KGB came back and said, look, Trotsky doesn't care about Russia anymore. He wants to ignite the communist revolution overseas. He thinks Russia is a failed experiment. If we can get worldwide communism running, Russia will just have to fall into line. He doesn't care about you, Stalin. Uh, Stalin didn't like this. He was convinced that Trotsky was engaged in a conspiracy. So he told the proto-KGB, make me the evidence. So over a course of nine months, the KGB abducted, psychologically tortured, and manufactured evidence, got people to perjure themselves in court by claiming they were part of a conspiracy by Trotsky. Uh, to take over Russia, and then what happens is these people were then executed for their part in the conspiracy, uh, and an arrest warrant was sent out for Trotsky, which eventually led to his assassination in Mexico outside of Peter Carlo's house with an ice pick. Mm -hmm. What happened during this period of time is that John Dewey, a famous American philosopher, went, hmm, I really hate Stalin. I mean, I absolutely loathe him. I trust nothing he's done. I'm going to look into these particular claims about the, uh, about the trials and see whether Trotsky really was up to this thing that I don't think he could have been up to. And so he formed a commission, the Dewey Commission, and they analyzed the trial transcripts and all of the available evidence. And they discovered anomalies. Trotsky's son, who was killed, after death has meetings in various cities all through Europe. And they got back to me a bit old. <laughs> Trotsky himself has meetings in different parts of Europe on the same day and in a period before rapid transportation. And so they developed all of this evidence that showed that the case for Trotsky and his sympathizers was weak and looked like a massive conspiracy by the state. They then showed this dossier to the governments of the UK and the US, and the UK and the US said, oh, this is interesting, we should probably check this out. So they phoned Russia up and said, hey, Russia, uh, are, are your trials free and fair? Uh, <laughs> Russia said, of course they are. These people are simply promoting disinformation. So this is the point in time where the term disinformation is coined for the first time by the Russian state 
to tar the conspiracy theories of John Dewey as being warrantless. Then when Stalin dies in 1956, the Peter Khrushchev admits um, to the committee that the trials were a sham and the Dewey Commission was largely right. Khrushchev was essentially separating himself from what went on to show that the new communist Russia under Khrushchev would not be quite the totalitarian state that it was under Stalin, despite the fact that actually Khrushchev was instrumental in the conspiracy in, in the first place. So this is a case where the Russian state admitted to running a massive conspiracy all to get one man, Leon Trotsky. So it's a very good example of a conspiracy theory that was derided at the time which turned out to be warranted nonetheless. The Dewey Commission got it right. Russia actually did engage in a conspiracy. So that's why it's a nice example of a warranted conspiracy theory. Okay, back to the first question. So what unites all of these things we've got on the board? The official view doesn't seem to make sense, or the official presentation seems to... All right, so we've got, so we've got some notions. So Brussels said we had worries about evidence. Uh, most of these are rivals to an official view. I'm doing that terrible thing of talking to uh, the board, which teachers should never do. Uh, they're very difficult to falsify. Ah. Would you like to explain more about that? Well, I, I mean, how do you disprove you know, what people have said? Hard to disprove. And actually, that's where the Moscow show trials ends up being quite interesting. Mm. Because the Moscow show trials alleges a massive statewide conspiracy by the Russian government to engage in a cover-up. Now, that's a really, really big claim and also quite difficult to prove. As the Dewey Commission discovered, they had all the evidence in the world and yet they couldn't persuade anyone of it because the Russian state said, no, 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 they're barking up the wrong tree. It's just a conspiracy theory here. So sometimes the notion of something being hard to disprove, or the notion the theory can't be falsified, is going to be problematic for a conspiracy theory, because conspiracy theories by and large predict information that would make them hard to falsify. If you assume there is a large-scale conspiracy out to get you, then of course they're going to produce disinformation and put it into the world to make your conspiracy theory something which looks unfalsifiable. We normally treat unfalsifiable theories as being bad in some sense. Ipso facto, the theory must be ridiculous, but actually if it turns out there is a large-scale conspiracy in operation, then actually the lack of evidence ends up weirdly being a kind of evidence in support of it in the first place. Uh, this was a point that was actually put forward by the American philosopher Brian L. Keeley that says, look, falsification is a really great thesis when it comes to scientific hypotheses. When it comes to hypotheses where the entities we're talking about are not emotionless electrons, protons, and neutrons, but human beings with agendas, actually it turns out falsification is not a particularly good hypothesis for social explanations. So the notion that conspiracy theories might be hard to falsify is actually something which is not necessarily a bad mark against them. What else links our conspiracy theories? Small number of dishonest All right, so they are made up of conspirators. These are our small number of actors. Do they necessarily have to be made up of a small number of actors? Why might we go for restriction and scope? Yes. So, um, a large conspiracy theory we missed on here was that for many years, people thought the NSA was listening to their phone calls. Absolutely massive conspiracy. Oh, it wasn't a conspiracy. Uh, it, was, it was true. Uh, but there were a massive amount of people involved in that and a massive amount of knowledge, and yet somehow, uh, somehow the truth never got out there. Actually, so this, is, this is a really good question. Prior to the NSA link, uh, reveal leaks, who here thought that it was likely that the American government was spying on your communications? Who here thought that after the leaks? All right, so a few people suddenly went from going, oh, that seems, that seems a little bit out there, suddenly going, oh, actually everything we know about the world seems slightly wrong, I'm going to be a hardcore skeptic for the rest of my life about all public in information. Don't actually, actually go that, who, that far. A good question would be, who, who suspected that it was being done on scale? 
Well, right, yeah, and actually that, that, that's the other thing. There will be people going, well, look, they probably spy on more people than we, we think they do, but it's probably only bad people they're spying on. Uh, and then it turns out that basically they're spying on anyone. Uh, Amanda Inanucci, writer of Veep, and the thick, thick of it is if he wants to write a sitcom based at the in, 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 in NSA, where you have the smooth-talking PR people in front of house who go, of course, you know, we're a very well-organized uh, institution, everything's above board, and then you flick to the warehouse where all the collated dust has been collected, and the workers screaming, we haven't even finished categorizing the last in influx, and now there's even more coming in. Uh, so one of the selves, some people think, is uh, good with the NSA data collection. They're collecting so much data, it's hard to know whether they can analyze all of it. Uh, but of course, then if you believe the conspiracy theories, uh, then they've got the advanced computing technology to do it nonetheless. <laughs> all right, anything else you want to say which links these things together? A lot of them seem to have a hidden agenda behind the... All right, so we've got conspirators, we've got intent, and we've got secrecy. Thank you. Can't spell secrecy, apparently. Uh, board work today is not, not working out, must improve. Uh, right, and actually that gets me to where I want us to be. Definition of a conspiracy. You need a number of actors who are working together, what we call the conspirators. They must have some kind of intention, so they require that they are working towards some purpose, and, of course, they've got to be operating with a certain amount of secrecy. Now, it's quite possible that their certain amount of secrecy isn't particularly good, so they get revealed almost instantaneously, uh, or they may decide to shed their secrecy after an act is performed. So when you think about the conspirators who assassinated Julius Caesar, they admitted to the crime as soon as Caesar was dead, because they assumed the Roman public would applaud them for killing the dictator, what they failed to realize is that actually the plebeians loved Caesar and hated the aristocrats. So the fact the aristocrats killed Caesar made the public turn against them very quickly. But this gives us what a conspiracy is. So if we can satisfy these three claims, we have a claim of conspiracy. People acting in secret towards some end. Is there an element of, you know, that... For example, Christchurch stands out. What you said about Christchurch stands out as a as a as a difference from all of those because it's not likely to be really possible. So there's got to be an element of possibility being real. So. So the fact that gay marriage caused the Christchurch earthquake mm -hmm. is kind of quite different from there was government action in place and the people on plane crash. Kind of okay, thing. so you're saying there's it's a kind of, a kind of different kind of conspiracy theory here. Just politics. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So, in this case, if we take it that, all right. So, so, if, so we might go look. The homosexual version of this plan, the South Korean or homosexual versions of Christchurch conspiracy theory. Uh, the homosexual one fails to be a conspiracy because it's a kind of act of God style thing. There's a divine force that opposes particular socially progressive views. But of course there are other versions of it. There's the Harp version. Mm. Anyone heard of the Harp yeah, yeah, yeah. installation? Oh, nice. yeah, okay. Harp is a giant array in Alaska. It's designed for bouncing radio waves off the ionosphere. It's part of an American experiment to be able to extend their communication network. So, basically, so at the moment, one of the problems with warfare, one of the many problems with warfare, is that if you want to communicate with your troops on the field in a foreign battlefield, you basically have to send your signals through a bunch of relays or through satellites which might become compromised. If you could just bounce your radio signal off the ionosphere, you have a direct communication which is hard to intercept. So Americans are basically working on this kind of technology. But the HARP installation is a publicly funded installation. So they produce basically a graph of their power output throughout the day. And many conspiracy theorists have looked at the HARP output and then found power spikes and associated, associated those with weird weather anomalies around the world. I saw um, a HARP cloud the day before the crash. You saw a HARP cloud? <laughs> yeah. How so do you know it was a HARP cloud? It's a rippling cloud. But... <laughs> Okay, so you saw, so you so you saw um, evidence <laughs> of, the, of the priming of heart to set off the earthquake. Uh, so yeah, so this one actually says that look, 
The earthquake was caused by the American military engaged in investigations, and it's a conspiracy because they're keeping secret either the fact the heart research has deleterious side effects, or they're keeping secret the fact that the real reason behind heart is because it's a geo-weapon, and actually the earthquake was deliberately caused. Uh, and the Fukushima uh, earthquake, uh, sorry, the, the, the tsunami that damaged the power, power plant in Japan is also blamed upon heart, using exactly the same mechanism. Uh, so, yes, you're right. The, this one looks like an act of God and thus fails the condition. You could say God's the biggest. Well, yes, and actually some, what, at least one philosopher has actually made that particular claim that God would be the ultimate conspirator. And if you're Catholic, it must be the tripartite version of God. God can conspire on its own because it's made up of three individuals. So it's very different. Oh, yeah. And, well, so you can suddenly make it back into a conspiracy theory, uh, as Moira points out, because you say, look, it's a gay agenda. If those gays didn't go around being gay, um, and they know it's wrong, so this is the interesting thing. If they were being gay, we wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have earthquakes. And they keep on denying that they cause earthquakes, which is part of the gay agenda. Uh, they just don't care about people, is the way that particular conspiracy theory goes. Uh, yes, the gay agenda. Uh, all right. So we have a claim of conspiracy. What's interesting about claims of conspiracy is, of course, we could live in a world where conspiracies are really, really common. In fact, actually, some political philosophers claim we already live in that world. We live in a world where people engage in the secret intent to host birthday parties for people, surprise, surprise parties. That would qualify as a conspiracy under this particular claim, i.e. the notion that if someone decides they want to surprise a friend and they organize with their other friends to do it in secret uh, to cause the birthday party to occur, that seems like conspiratorial activity. Now, is that the kind of conspiratorial activity we associate with conspiracy theories? <clears throat> Would you accept that an explanation of a surprise party qualifies as a conspiracy theory? It seems to be a, like a, a bit of general distrust of someone behind the lines as well, like distrust of government. Um, well, almost, almost any company yeah. is going to be, have, have, to some extent, have some conspirators intending to do something, probably doing it secretly. All right, so there are, so there are here two, two answers which have come up here. One notion is that actually when we're talking about conspiracy theories, we're not talking about mild things like the organization of birthday parties and the like. We're talking about institutional conspiracies. We're talking about large organizations that have a certain amount of power being up to no good. Uh, and that's the kind of malevolence notion that comes out in these particular kinds of discussions. When we talk about conspiracy theories, we're talking about some kind of intent to do wrong or, if not wrong, because not many conspirators are mustachioed villains who twirl their mustaches whilst laughing maniacally. What they are doing is they're trying to cover up something, or they're doing something that most people would know to be suspicious. Well, it's, it, I mean, for me, that would be what would rule out a kind of surprise party. It, it's conspiracy theory if, after the event, the official story was, no, that just happened by accident. People happened to be there with presents and, you know, what you know, it's your birthday. Where what had really happened was that people had conspired to do it. Yeah. That would then be a conspiracy theory, rather than planning to do something in the future. I don't see how that... Oh, but, so, but the claim is, if they were planning to do it in the future, and they kept it secret, <laughs> if they are uh, a guest lecture, <laughs> uh, uh, then, then that might qualify as being conspiratorial. So, i.e., the notion is, the organization of the surprise party seems to fit the conditions of people acting in secret towards some end, in the same way that if I decide to engage in a massive conspiracy to derail the vote in Epsom later this year to ensure that David Seymour doesn't become the new MP for Epsom and thus ensure that ACT has no representation, and I get everyone in this room to agree to this and we start acting towards that, we're paying to do something in the future, presumably because we've got the... Uh, our particular Chatham House rules, none of us are going to be talking about it or tweeting about what I've just suggested. So you're all now sworn to secrecy by the rules of KiwiFu. Uh, we are now engaged in a conspiracy to, dest to destroy ACT. All those in favour say aye. <laughs> all those against say nay. 
take, take that person outside and execute her because she may not obey the rules. Uh, so that would fit a conspiracy in the same way that organizing a surprise party for David Seymour when he fails to become MP for Epsilon uh, might also qualify as being a conspiracy. And Epsilon's for Goldsmith was not a secret. No, no, but and thus, was it, was it a conspiracy? Yeah, it was a conspiracy, no. No, it was a political campaign because it, was dull, it was, wasn't done in secret. You had an intention, uh, but of course, because it was all based around hipsters, it was always bound to fail. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't done in secret. If you'd done it in secret, it may, it may have been more successful. Uh, I actually have no idea. Uh, but the whole point is we could live in a world where there are lots of conspiracy. And arguably, we probably do live in a world so, where... So you, you, is, doesn't that fundamentally describe every American sitcom television series? Yeah, uh, 30-minute episode, 10 minutes of intro, one big lie, 20 minutes covering up the lie. Actually, I quite like this as an idea. The conspiracy theory of comedy. Yeah. That most sitcoms can be described as a series of failed conspiracies. Because the punchline is always, they get found out. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's always a lie with them. I think there's a paper no idea in that. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, um, and so that, that would point the argument that actually conspiratorial-like activity is fairly common. But often when we talk about conspiracy theories, we're not talking about that low-level stuff. We're talking about the larger institutional stuff. So the big question becomes, just how common are these conspiracies in the world, the political world that we think we live in. Who here thinks that it's quite likely there's at least one major conspiracy going on within New Zealand at this particular point in time? Oh, all right, that's actually much more than I was expecting, actually. I was expecting there to be a nice, naive trust of governmental forces. You know what? To give me an idea of what they think that conspiracy is. Oh, well, I could just talk about at, at a low level. Like, you know, if someone makes a... You know, it's pick someone in the government at the moment and, and an incident happens and they're all sitting around in the cabinet room and they're saying, right, this is going to look bad when it comes out and the press get hold of it. So they all conspire to come out and make a statement which is relentlessly positive about what's happened, even though actually if you examine the facts, it's not. Are you talking about the TPPA? could be anything, right? It could actually be anything. But what I'm saying is it actually happens in politics on a daily basis. This is what they do now, isn't it? Well, and I mean, many political historians will say the history of politics is one conspiracy after the other. Uh, and you work in secret to achieve some particular end, and then you try to present that end to the public as a fait accompli, or you try and force it through by making the public think they're voting for it. Now, it's a fairly fatalistic or nihilistic view of politics, but it does seem to be a very common mode of political thought at this time. That basically, they're all untrustworthy. You just tend to vote for the least worst rather than the best. Is it yes. the case that in, in most competitive endeavours there will be conspiracies involved because of the requirement for secrecy to protect yourself against your competitor? Yeah, often, I mean, criminal conspiracies with respect to corporate malfeasance are prosecuted through the courts all the time. It's actually what's interesting about discussion of conspiracies. We are very happy to admit that corporations engage in conspiratorial activity all the time. Activity, I'm not quite sure where that word came from. <laughs> conspiratorial activity all the time. <laughs> but we don't seem to say, well, until recently, we didn't think it was particularly common in the political world. For some reason, politicians were able to rise above this kind of human nature we see in the corporate world. Now, one argument is actually the political world has changed and become more corporate, or we've actually become more aware that actually the human beings we think of as being superior as our politicians are actually just like us, and we would do exactly the same thing as they would. Now, the, what I'm trying to get to here is that even if we believe in a world that's filled with conspiracies, it's still something to say a conspiracy theory is the best explanation of an event. Because lots of conspiracies go completely awry. People decide to say, organize a surprise par party for a friend on the weekend, or organize it on Wednesday, Wednesday comes along, they have a few drinks, they forget to do it, uh, or we'll do it next week, and eventually just nothing ever comes of it. Lots of that kind of organization never results in things. <coughs> lots of startups decide they're going to keep secret what they're working on, and then nothing ever comes of it. 
it's one thing to say conspiracies exist. It's another thing to say that the conspiracy that you have managed to show in some way explains some event within the world. So what's interesting about conspiracy theories, this is where we're now going to move into the way we can use them for teaching, uh, is that actually there's a whole bunch of pedagogical issues which we can illustrate when it comes to working out what good critical thinking is. So let me go to these slides that bring us towards the end of our time together. Okay, so conspiracy theories illustrate certain problems in inferential reasoning. So they illustrate problems we have when we're trying to infer that some hypothesis, theory, or explanation is the one we want to adopt and take to be good. And also the kind of thing we want to then tell our friends about and try and persuade them based upon the evidence. And they present issues as to what qualifies as evidence. Why is Lord Christopher Monckton a bad expert to appeal to when it comes to talk about climate change? Who here doesn't know about Lord Christopher Monckton? All right, so he's a British peer of the realm. Uh, who worked for the Thatcher government and tours around the world claiming that anthropogenic climate change is a croc set up by the UN which is part of the communist agenda which has rebranded itself as green rather than red. What have I not said about Lord Monckton in that description? He has no, he, he has no not qualifications. Not hmm? He's not a lawyer. Well, no, so he's a hereditary, he has a hereditary oh, title. Right. title. He is, isn't a member of the House of Lords, although he presents himself as a member of the House of Lords. Uh, so he's a peer of the realm, uh, but he seems to confuse being a peer of the realm as being the kind of person who's been peer reviewed. I'm sorry, that's a terrible part. Um, but it's the notion that he's put forward as being an expert. But he's not actually an appropriate expert. Sure, he goes around talking about climate change all the time. But there's nothing about the story you can tell about Moncton that actually makes him the kind of person you would appeal to when, say, given a choice between Moncton and James Hansen, who has extensive degrees when it comes to climate science and is able to back his things up, not just by an appeal to his degree, but also an appeal to his peer-reviewed work. So they present issues when it comes to evidence. Many conspiracy theories, not all, rest upon shaky appeals to experts that when you investigate them further, actually turn out to be not the right kind of expert to appeal to. Isn't there another part of that in which the genuine experts uh, tend to be vilified and marginalised? Yes, there's, there's yeah. Been, you, know, you see it a lot, in, um, particularly in climate change, when Hanson's had death threats. Yes, yeah, no, there's a... Repeated attempts to remove him from his post. Yes, so there's also a kind of jealousy of the people with the right kind of expertise where they're presented as being enemies to the state in some particular fashion. So you either get the death threat or you'll get the... Well, but they shouldn't be talking about these things. Surely as public servants, they're meant to remain completely neutral on these particular issues and thus not actually respond to attacks or talk about science. Because, you know, that's not what we pay them for. We simply pay for them to publish in obscure journals that no one, e no one ever reads. Uh, so we saw that with... Oh, who was the climate scientist that John Key said could be traded opinions for? Mike Joy. Not Mike Joy. Oh, yeah, sorry. Was it... Uh, uh, where, where Mike Joy was doing the critic's conscience role within science, and the Prime Minister basically said, oh, you know, he's an academic, you can trade them like lawyers. Uh, so that was vilifying an expert, just for the sheer fact that the expert dared to speak out against the government. The other thing, conspiracy theories are really, really useful when it comes to allowing us to explore rival hypotheses. And that's why I didn't want anyone to come in with a prejudice against conspiracy theories, and I wanted people to be able to throw up any particular hypothesis they came up on the board. Imagine in the classroom situation where you're trying to explore the notion that sometimes evidence can point in more than one direction. So you can have evidence for a particular claim, you can have counter evidence against that claim, evidence which falls between different camps, and you want to go, well, look, which explanation do we judge to be the best in this situation? 
Here's a conspiracy theory versus an official theory. Let's look at what kind of evidence supports each individual claim here and work out why would we prefer one particular story over the other. Maybe you use the Moscow show trial to go, look, if you were a humble Moscovite living in Russia at that time, who would you believe? The Dewey Commission? Or would you believe what your government had just told you? Okay, change of context. Imagine you're living in London or New York at this time, and the Dewey Commission presents its findings towards you. Who do you trust? The Russian state who denies it, or the evidence that's been provided to you by the Dewey Commission? Okay, let's move forward by 20 years. Now Nikita Khrushchev has actually said, look, actually it was a conspiracy. Now what do you make of your previous decisions? You can talk about the context under which evidence comes about, and the way that rival hypotheses can change their value as to whether they're justified or not justified, depending <laughs> on what else might be go what else might be going on. <laughs> that, that dog's obviously trying to stop particular hypotheses uh, from coming to life. Are you sure it's a dog? <laughs> you know, actually, I have I, I know so so little about dogs that actually I have no idea what it might be. There are a lot of robots around. That's true, actually. There's an awful lot, lot of robots. Are any robots in this class? Uh, good, good. Eventually you will rise up and destroy us all. Uh, so we can use conspiracy theories for evaluating different types of hypotheses, and we can do it in a fairly interesting way. We can talk about the moon landing, and we can talk about, you know, what are the reasons that we can come up for that show that the moon landing isn't likely to be a good explanation of what happened? Sorry, the moon landing hoax. A good explanation of what happened in the 1960s. Why do we disbelieve Kenran's claim that there's a Met Service conspiracy against him uh, to show that actually the lunar cycle has more effect on tides and earthquakes than we currently give it credit for? Why might we decide that actually when Paul McCartney says he's not dead, uh, that Paul McCartney's not dead. I mean, Paul McCartney is quite adamant that he didn't die. Uh, although, of course, if he, if he is an imposter, that's exactly what, what, you, what he would say. Uh, what, are the, what, what are the various theories about why the princess died? Assassination is or isn't a particularly good hypothesis. How do we judge the evidence there? Um, <clears throat> MH370, of course, is actually quite fascinating. Uh, there, for some reason, there's a media discourse that's going, look, the CIA and Malaysian authority are investigating quite heavily the notion that the planes were hijacked, and yet all the evidence that's been presented to us is perfectly congruent with the notion of there being an electrical fire on board the plane, the pilots turning the plane towards an airport and then dying en route, and thus the plane eventually crashing when it ran out of fuel. Now, is this a situation, we use this when talking about the media, where the CIA is saying, look, we're investigating this, because if it turns out to be true, we've got to know about it, but we don't think it's particularly likely? Or is it a case where the CIA has access to information that has not been made public, which they don't want to reveal to the world just yet, which shows that actually the hijacking hypothesis is quite likely compared to the perfectly, I would say, normal, uh, much more mundane explanation of the flight of the fate of MH370. So we can use these conspiracy theories to illustrate the way we reason and the way we come to particular hypotheses as part of building up inferential skills in our students because they're wonderful examples for the sheer fact that they are in many cases innately interesting. If you tell people that there are claims that in New Zealand there existed a pre-Maori people called the Patapadahi, uh, who were wiped out by the Maori when they first got there, and this is a bad hypothesis. Why is it a bad hypothesis? You build in an interesting question about learning our own lo local history through the lens of rather interesting, interesting theories. In the same respect, when you want to talk about, is there really an agenda? to hide suppressed evidence, uh, sorry, suppressed inventions, you build upon the notion that these, imagine if Tesla's inventions were all true, what would the world be like? Okay, what's the basis for thinking these inventions exist but are suppressed? This is the notion that maybe they just don't work. These are just innately interesting ways to get inferential practice into the classroom.
And that way I fulfill both of the re remits of this particular session to talk about conspiracy theories for the vast majority of you who want to know more about them, whilst also satisfying the small number of conspiratorial teachers who want to improve the inferential practices of our students and thus make them much better students in the education workplace and also much worse children at home since they'll start asking questions of their parents and not accepting their mere appeals to authority. <laughs> My name is Matthew Dentist, and I endorse what I've just said. <laughs>